Hello everybody, welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host, Ricardo Lopes, and today I'm joined by Dr. David Latti. He is Associate Professor of Biology at Queen's College, City University of New York, where he runs a behavior and evolution laboratory. His work focuses on evolutionary and behavioral ecology, especially the evolution of complex and learned traits in birds, and humans. So, Dr. Lati, welcome to the show. It's a pleasure to everyone. Thank you very much, Ricardo. It's great to be here. Okay, great. So, uh, let's start with talking about complex trait. So, from an evolutionary perspective, what is a complex trait? Right. So, I would say that you could imagine complexity evolutionarily, which means that selection would be necessary for it. So if it's a very simple trait, it could evolve, you could say, by accident or through a few steps that could be possible without any guiding force in evolution, so through drift, for instance. But the more complex a trait, the more steps that are required in order to produce the trait, the more complex we would we would call it and so natural selection would be necessary in order as the only guiding principle in evolution um to um to create such a trait or to be responsible for such a trait now we could also define a trait as complex developmentally so that what i just said was evolutionarily but developmentally um, complex traits we we often think about in terms of how many steps are required not through evolutionary time but through developmental time so for instance uh, learned traits that require this immense cognitive structure in order to produce them and um, for instance uh, social learning you know maybe you have this cognitive structure and then you need to observe somebody else doing something like language that would be an, a, a very complex trait from a developmental perspective. Mm -hmm. So these complex traits, I mean, they can both be, be part of the evolved repertoire of a particular organism, but they can also be learned. Is that it? Yes, exactly. So um, there's no, uh, the, it's, it's a rather unfortunate uh, historical, I would say, accident in the popular perception of science that we have a distinction between learned and evolved behavior because the very cognitive structures that are involved in learning must themselves be a product of evolution. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, uh, with that in mind, uh, how do we distinguish a behavior that, as I said, is part of the evolved repertoire of a given animal and is, in a sense, innate, let's put it that way, from a trait that is learned? Right. Well, first of all, although I totally understand what you're saying, I don't like the term innate because okay. etymologically that means in natum or from birth in, in Latin. And a lot of our traits that don't involve learning or don't involve very much uh, environmental input, for instance, such as the age of menarche in, in women, where the, uh, the, the first time that uh, girls have their period, that is not something that's learned, and yet it's not happening from birth either. Yeah. And so uh, what we really need to do is have a term, and it's not, it, it doesn't make sense to set, call it an instinct either, right? So we, we have to come up with a more subtle and nuanced way to think about, about traits. There are traits that involve a lot of learning, like language, or traits that involve apparently no learning at all, um, like um, age of first reproduction and uh, well I mean in terms of reproductive ability um, when I was saying in, in terms of menarche for instance um, and then there are traits that involve some learning some practice and then some uh, traits that develop without any uh, learning so it's it's really a fluid uh, 
uh, developmental process that involves a lot of different inputs. But your question was primarily about how do you tell the difference between something that is learned and something that is unlearned? Well, the way we generally do that is to keep the environment exactly the same for a bunch of organisms and then see if they're, um, or, or keep the environment same or different and see how that affects the uh, development of a particular trait. We call those common garden experiments. And if you have genetically different organisms performing exactly the same in the same environment, but different in different environments, then you can suggest that perhaps there was an environmental influence on that particular trait. Whereas if you had um, identical organisms like clones that, per, uh, that performed exactly the same in the same environment, but performed differently in different environments. I don't know if I lost track of myself there, but basically you can see what I'm saying in general, that if clones behave differently in different environments, then there's an environmental effect. If, if genetically dis different organisms behave um, the same in a particular environment, then pro in different environments, then probably there's a genetic influence on the behavior. Mm -hmm. So earlier you said that these complex traits, I mean, cannot be the result of an evolutionary accident, like, for example, genetic drift or something like that. So does that imply that they necessarily are adaptations or could it be the case that some of them are byproducts of adaptations? Right. So I would say that although we have a very strenuous, George Williams in 1966 called it an onerous process by which we determine whether something is an adaptation or not. Mm -hmm. And it's very difficult to establish that it is. I would say that in general, whenever you have a trait that is expensive to produce, and it is functionally integrated, it has a very uh, specific role or purpose, that it is very unlikely that it came about by any means other than natural selection, unless it was the product of a guiding force such as a brain. So a plastic brain like our own can produce an iPhone Something yes, like I was that. saying that the the only way in which a human trait or any trait of any organism uh, that is functionally integrated and very complex, meaning requiring many steps in order to produce, could not be a result of natural selection directly is if it is indirectly a result of natural selection, for instance, being the result of a brain that was the result of natural selection. And that's so I was showing my iPhone as an example of, um, of, a, of a, a trait, an extended phenotype in that case, um, of, um, that is indirectly a result of natural selection because natural selection fashioned the human brain and then the human brain was in, uh, indirect, then uh, able to fashion the iPhone. Mm -hmm. I understand. So I know that you study birds. Are there any yeah. particular insights that you got from studying birds and that we perhaps could apply to other species? Right. So birds have complex behavior mm -hmm. they, that involves significant learning. Um, they are diurnal, which means they're active during the daytime. And so you can find them and study them in the, in the light. And so for a biologist, a field biologist, they are easy to study compared to uh, organisms like bats, for instance, that are um, active at night and difficult to study. And they're pretty, so a lot of uh, people are well aware of them and well aware of where they are, so you can find them, etc. Um, my own focus on birds was rather fortuitous. I did not study birds because of any of these uh, uh, features of them, but only because when I went to the University of Michigan as a graduate student, what I really wanted to do is study 
the evolution of a vertebrate trait through time uh, in real time, meaning in the historical period. I wanted to focus on a trait that had evolved, um, you know, in the last couple hundred years or something like that. So I just ended up flipping through encyclopedias of introduced organisms, introduced vertebrates, birds, mammals, reptiles, in order to look for one that might have the kinds of features where I could look at the introduced range. By introduced, I mean where humans have brought the organism and compare it to the native range and see genetically and in terms of their traits, whether they have evolved since we humans with our ships and, you know, planes, et cetera, had introduced organisms to new habitats. And the one that I ended up finding that was most appropriate, and by appropriate I mean in two ways. One is that my um, doctoral advisor, uh, Robert Payne, studied birds, and he particularly he studied uh, brood parasitism, where there are cuckoos that um, foist reproductive care on their, um, their host. Uh, so that was one way in which my uh, situation where the, 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 the situation I discovered was um, appropriate. And another is that you could predict how the bird would change or evolve once it was introduced. That's the most important thing, that it was introduced long ago and you could predict based on selection in the old country and selection in the new country how the bird should, based on evolutionary theory, evolve. And so that is the reason I chose birds, because I just happened to find one that fit that criteria. Mm -hmm. Right. But, I, I mean, I think that another question that I tried to ask you is, um, what are some of the traits that you've studied in birds that can be extrapolated to other species? I mean, what are some of the best insights that you got from birds and are they a good model for studying certain right. traits? Well, I would say two things to that. Number one is that any trait that we see evolving through time following introduction is a worthwhile trait to study from an evolutionary perspective because all traits uh, evolve. And, and so uh, it doesn't matter whether you're studying the feeding habits of a worm or the shell color of a snail, or in my case, um, the uh, the ability and the tendency for a particular bird to reject eggs that are placed in their nest by another species, all of these have the features that make them generalizable in evolutionary biology and particularly evolutionary ecology, which is the study of the um, selective evolution or evolution by natural selection mm -hmm. of traits that have a function in their natural environment in the wild. And so no matter what um, you study, th those will be relevant. So that's number one. Um, number two, I would say, is my particular focus on bird song more recently is um, more narrowly applicable, not only as a feature that evolves by natural selection, but because it involves social learning in the same way that many human traits do, it uh, falls under the category of a socially learned trait that evolves by cultural evolution, not only genetic evolution. And so the balance or the interplay between those two sorts of change through time is something that is recently becoming a really important focus of in, uh, interest in, in biology and in the biolog what you could call the evolutionary social sciences. What, um, how do traits change through time that are socially learned? Mm -hmm. Can we say that birds, or at least some bird species, have culture? 
I would say yes, although I would have to preface that by um, assuring people for whom that is a strange statement that I'm making a very particular statement about a, a biological definition of culture. So the biological definition of culture is different from the definition that we might find, say, in cultural anthropology or in history um, or in archaeology or in sociology. So in those areas, culture has to do with ideas. Mm -hmm. And this is a very nebulous concept, right? But it's something that we um, are totally ready to embrace with respect to humans. It has to do with the things that are in our minds and the things that we share with each other. Um, so I have an idea that killing an innocent person is wrong. Now, that's a cultural trait right there, um, even though it's uh, I'm generating it right now out of my own head, and I'm not a culture myself. I'm, an, I'm only a part of a culture. Now, what we've done is biologists have used that term and created an analog, an analog to it um, or an analogy to it. And that is, but it may not just be an analogy, actually, because it actually may be the definition that everyone should use for culture uh, because we can't get into the minds of other organisms like we can, we only partially get into the minds of other human beings. And so what really is it that makes a cultural anthropologist or an archaeologist call something cultural? I think what it is, is precisely what the biologists call culture, which is that it's socially learned, at least partially. I mean, partly it may be innovated within the mind of an organism, but it's at least partially inherited socially from somebody else through learning. And it can change over the next step. So I receive something, and then someone learns it from me, and it can change in that two-step process. That makes it culture. And in that, by that biological definition, which, notice, we don't have to get into the mind of an organism in order to do that. All we have to do is know that it was learned um, by whatever mechanism, socially learned. So if... Um, by that definition, birdsong is culture. And not only that, but that means that by far, birds are the largest repositories of culture uh, in the entire, on the entire earth, in the entire history of life. Because there are roughly 5,000 birds that learn their songs. I mean, Obviously, we would much rather learn how to make an iPhone if we had to start from scratch than learn how to sing a, a cardinal song. But what I'm saying is that in terms of the number of cultural species, uh, birds um, have by far the largest numbers. Mm -hmm. To understand how a particular species learns certain behaviors, is it important to look at their sociality and how they establish relationships with one another i would say yes because the it's not any old kind of learning that results in culture it's only social learning it's only learning from other members of your own species and so by far the uh, the majority of organisms don't interact with each other at all um, maybe they interact with each other only when they're mating and that's only for sexual species but uh, for the rest of their life, they would just assume not interact with anybody in their own species ever because they are competitors. Uh, another member of your own species has exactly the same requirements as you do. You don't want to meet them when you are trying to gather resources yourself. But there are just a few species, like those 5,000 birds and a few bats, a few uh, cetaceans, whales and dolphins, uh, humans, maybe elephants, maybe some other organisms um, where the interactions that they have within a species, which is dictated by their sociality, as you rightly say, uh, result in the capacity to have culture or the capacity to have either, you know, one of the two kinds of culture, this sort of communicative culture where things just change over time 
randomly or maybe the technological kind of culture where things improve over time to achieve a function. Mm -hmm. Can we talk about cultural evolution in any other species apart from humans? Yes, I would say, um, and that's a great segue because essentially what um, I'm saying about culture is that there are two kinds of it. And you can look and you can determine the difference in kind by looking at whether the changes that happen are functional and thus build on the previous versions of it or whether they're just accidents in the same way that we used to call in the game telephone where you would say something complicated to somebody next to you and by the time it went around the whole circle of people and it came back to you it was very different there that there was no building upon that that's the that's the communicative sort of cultural evolution and in that sense we know that whales have it we know that birds have it um Apparently, bats have it, although it hasn't been very well studied. It's possible that elephants have it, although no one knows. Um, and But we also know that our closest relatives, the great apes, do not have it. They do not learn their vocalizations in that sense. So that's the communicative culture that doesn't build. It just changes. Um, like the difference between Frisian and English, or Portuguese and Spanish, or even Portuguese and English, or Chinese and French, you know, it doesn't matter how far, all of those differences presumably happen for non-functional random reasons because people started speaking to each other and accumulated differences. Now, I might be open to the suggestion that some of the differences between languages are actually functional. Um, the, the classic example is the fact that um, uh, the Aleut people or pe other people who live in the far north have many words for white or many words for snow. And this might not be the case in uh, jungle uh, areas. Uh, but the other kind of cultural evolution focuses on that sort of thing, which is the functional changes that happen over time and build. And in animals, which is what you asked, I think all of the examples that have ever been su even suggested with good evidence all have to do with gathering or preparing food. Uh, so it's not about language, it's not about anything else. Of course, in humans, we have it about everything. Uh, we have that sort of technological advancement in all areas. But in animals, I believe the only cultural evolution we see that is technological has to do with food. Mm -hmm. I understand. So just to go back a bit to evolved traits, um, I mean, um, it can, uh, when we think about evolved traits, we, we usually think about traits that species acquire during evolution. But can species also lose traits? And in what oh, ways? Yeah, sure. And uh, by the way, you know, we're, you mentioned cultural evolution, cultural evolution and genetic evolution are distinct. They're two parallel different ways of uh, uh, evolving traits. And matter of fact, um, generally speaking, when I say, every time I say evolve, what I really mean is genetic evolution. And anytime I'm ever referring to cultural evolution, I will say cultural before it, because that in cultural evolution, the transmission is by learning rather than by the, uh, by the passing on of genes. But yeah, in answer to your question, whether traits can also be lost, I would say they are lost way more often than they're gained. Um, J.B.S. Haldane, one of the architects of the modern synthesis of evolution, suggested that traits are lost eight times as often as they're gained. Now, I don't know how he got that, you know, that number. Oh, he didn't know enough to actually be able to um, develop that number from an actual analytical process. And I think that we don't either today, I would hope um, that eventually we will, able, we will be able to do it. I wrote a, um, uh, with a few co-authors uh, a, um, a paper on, on relaxed selection and the loss of traits in 2009, and even at that point, we were really rudimentary in our understanding of why traits are lost, how often they're lost, and um, um, the relationship between their loss and natural selection, which we recognize is extremely important 
in the gain of traits, but I would argue is also important in the loss of traits. It helps traits to be excised or um, lost much more quickly than they would by random processes. Mm -hmm. But we we have examples all over the place of uh, organisms losing traits. Uh, and why do they lose these traits? I mean, is it because they are no longer useful or functional or necessary? Or exactly, exactly. So most of the traits that we see being lost over time is because of a loss of function. So the, the, uh, the traits no longer serve the purpose that, they're an that they served in their ancestors. Yeah. And then through a variety of mechanisms, through random drift, through... Uh, mutation accumulation through selection on other traits that conflict with it, either at the genome level or at the trait expression level, these traits start to go away. So a great example are uh, scale insects. If you go outside in a northern environment and you look at needled trees like spruces and firs and pines, and you look and you see these little white uh, specks on there that look like dust, Those are actually insects. They've lost their wings. They've lost much of their um, sexual uh, system. They've lost much of their uh, uh, digestive system because all they need to do is attach to the needle and suck juices out of it, and they live entirely on that. And so a lot of parasites are like that. A lot of endoparasites, parasites that live inside of the bodies of organisms, have lost tons of traits, especially ones for moving around, because they don't need to move around anymore. They just hang out in the organism that they're parasitizing. Mm -hmm. Okay, so another topic that you're interested in, or at least I read about in your work, is evolutionary ethics. So could yeah. you tell us what is what that is about? Right. So... Um, I think that's an unfortunate term, first of all, because what it seems to suggest, having evolutionary be the adjective to ethics, the noun, is that it's ethics applied to evolution in the way we talk about business ethics or sexual ethics or environmental ethics. Uh, but the word evolutionary ethics does not mean that whatsoever. What it rather means is that is the application of evolutionary theory to understanding ethical judgment and ethical categories and moral values. Um, and I am very interested in that. I did my uh, much of my uh, philosophy PhD on that, and I continue to be involved in, in that field, although I don't really like that, that term. But it, essentially, if I could sum it up in a sentence, it would be the, uh, the analysis of morality from an evolutionary perspective with a particular interest in looking for the function of the categories good and bad um, or good and evil or right and wrong that we use in ethics. Mm -hmm. And is that is exclusively applied to humans or other species as well? Well, this is a matter of some debate, although I would not say it's tremendously important, that debate. Um, so I would say the answer is yes. It's exclusively applied to humans, although sometimes largely in a hope that a paper or a book will be read more widely, people will apply, authors will apply the concepts of morality or good and evil, etc., to other species besides humans. But any serious consideration of human behavior and animal behavior renders that a little bit ridiculous. Uh, even though um, I would fully, as a behavioral ecologist myself, recognize that a lot of what we consider to be morally relevant behavior and distinctions comes originally from our animal ancestry. Mm -hmm. Can we talk about the universal morality in humans? I mean, when we look across different cultures, sometimes it's easy to notice the differences in terms of how people behave, how they 
uh, establish relationships with one another and things like that. But uh, I mean, are there any aspects of morality that we know are universal? I would say that they are, but they're not necessarily at the level that we might initially search for them. So, for instance, when we look at the Ten Commandments in um, the Torah, for example, for Jews, Christians, and Muslims, we will see very applied um, uh, rules uh, for life. What does it mean to murder or kill or slay? in the thou shall not kill commandment, for instance, that is tremendously socially and culturally laden, that term of killing. It doesn't mean that you just can never end someone else's life or that a culture cannot participate by agreement to end somebody's life or that all war is wrong. That is not, all war is wrong may be true or false, but that's not what is meant by that statement in the Torah. And so, what the important thing for us to recognize is that just because a particular rule does not hold the same way in all cultures or has not been accepted universally doesn't mean that it doesn't represent a cultural universal. We might just be looking at a level that's too fine. We might be looking at the twigs of a tree of morality where the cultural universal is actually at the level of the limb or the trunk. Mm -hmm. But I would say, yes, if we go deep enough, morality is universal among humans. Mm -hmm. uh, and what is exactly the level where you establish that morality is universal? Because I would imagine that if we just look at superficially at culture, then morality is very different across different cultures and perhaps also on the level of behaviors for example but uh, are you interested for example in the kinds of uh, information processing mechanisms that are associated with morality i am although those information processing mechanisms are really our uh, means of processing and applying basic moral codes to our particular situation and so those by delving too much into those i think we're moving in the opposite direction from understanding um, any universalism in morality the way that we can find um a more a, an indicator of universalism in morality is to find out what the things are for. So when we say that the uh, so for instance to use another example from religion when um, Jesus says that all of the laws all of the morals boil down to love God and love your neighbor. He is claiming that morality boils down to love. That is the level where I would be interested as an evolutionary biologist to focus. What is love? Where did it come from? How has it manifested in different ways? Is it always good? Um, those are the kinds of questions that we should be looking at. Try to delve down into the very root of what it means for something to be good. Mm -hmm. I understand. So earlier I asked you about the relationship between sociality and learning. What is the relationship between sociality and morality? Mm. Well, I would say that um, morality is a cultural trait. And by saying that, I don't mean that it is just socially learned and has no importance beneath that. Because, you know, when I held up the iPhone earlier, there is truth in there, meaning that you have to understand electricity and you have to be correct about your understanding of electricity in order for that machine to work. In the same way, it may be the case, philosophers are split roughly 50-50 on this, but it may be the case that morality deals with truths as well. They are just not the same kinds of truths that are dealt with um, when we talk about the physics underlying the working of the iPhone. So I would say that, um, what was your particular question with regard to that again? Uh, I mean, 
what is the relationship between a particular species sociality right. and okay. their morality? Right. So, um, so I would say that so because it is a socially learned trait, uh, because morality is a socially learned trait, it will only evolve in an organism that has a very advanced social sociality. I would predict, you know, I'm, I'm getting science fiction-y here, but uh, I would predict that morality would evolve in any very intensely social species on any planet. Um, so anybody who um, imagines a world on another planet where organisms are involved, are interacting as intensely as we do in competition, conflict, and cooperation in love. On the other hand, there is going to have to be some rules that will govern that those interactions. Um, that is uh, necessary for that organism to survive, that social organism to survive. So at the very basic level, I would say that sociality is a prerequisite for morality. Now, some people will take that too far, and they will say that uh, social behavior is morality. I have a very elevated bar for morality as a philosopher, and I would say that it only reaches the level of morality when it becomes something that an organism can accept or reject as a rule for life, an ideal to be adhered to or to be rejected. Uh, I do not see that in other organisms besides humans, and that's why I say that only humans have morality on this planet. Mm -hmm. In terms of the relationship between sociality and morality, is it a good question to ask if one came before the other? I mean, uh, should we ask if first comes sociality and then morality or the other way around? Right. So our, um, I, I like those uh, researchers of human behavioral biology who call us ultra social, uh, which means many, many steps were required to reach the level of sociality that we have. Some people take that too far, and they ignore insects, which are very, very social as well. We call them eusocial for you know reasons that have nothing to do with what we're talking about now. But the, the, the point that I would want to make now is that it takes many, many steps to get to the level of sociality that we have as humans. The fact that, um, as I put in one paper at one point, the fact that a number of unrelated males can sit on a plane in an encased tin can, essentially, for seven hours between New York and London and not kill each other. That is very rare among organisms, and it begs a lot of questions. And the fact that we can do that means we are of a very advanced level of sociality. Now, your question was, how does morality feature into that, meaning how did it evolve along with that? I would call it a ratchet. Um, it had to go hand in hand with um, our sociality through time. So, for instance, there are some features of our morality, like mothers taking care of their offspring. That's about 140 million years old, the, the bond between mothers and offspring. Not only is that the origins of parental care in our lineage, it's the origins of love in our lineage, because the very things that caused those early mammals to gather their youngs, young ones to them, those hormonal and behavioral features are the ancestors of our own feelings, um, including feelings that you and I have for each other that don't, that don't relate to parent-child, uh, uh, parent-offspring relationships at all, but they still we inherited those fellow feelings, that, um, that, that philia, for even friendship, from those initial feelings that were only, about, only between mothers and their child. So there's, there's that very basic sort of thing that is the root of morality. And then there are other features of morality that are very, very recent. Like the idea, Darwin used the idea that all humans 
are equally morally considerable. And this is, um, this is enshrined in my own country's uh, uh, Declaration of Independence and in our Constitution. And I think most people probably accept this, or I don't know if most people accept it, but I would hope that most people accept it. But it's what Darwin pointed out is that it's a very recent phenomenon and it has to be taught because we haven't inherited it. So I would say morality has these features that are an amalgamation or a conglomerate of some very ancient old features and some very new radical features. Mm -hmm. Since we've been talking also about culture, we also there's also this phenomenon of gene culture coevolution. Would that also apply in the context of morality? I would say that a probably the best kept secret in the new field of cultural evolution is that almost all cultural evolution is gene culture coevolution. Um, and so uh, we've tended to view it as this sort of weird thing that might happen in the same way as when we're doing mathematics, we have one factor and then another factor. And then we have this little thing that we may or may not put in, which is the interaction between the two factors. But in fact, the interaction between the two factors may be where all the interesting stuff lies. And I think that may be the case with cultural evolution. It certainly seems to be the case in terms of genes and environment. You know, and that's why I don't like the nature nurture debate is because probably all the interesting stuff or most of it happens in that third term, which is the interaction between the first two terms. And so, yeah, gene culture coevolution is extremely important. It's very complex. So this, you know, for your readership, if they're not familiar with it, as, as, or your, uh, th those who are watching uh, your podcast, the idea here is that uh, genetic change can be pushed by cultural change or vice versa. Uh, so for instance, if you had a cultural change where people started to drink the milk of other animals, this might seem gross to a lot of people. I'm just kidding. We got, many of us do it. Uh, if you start drinking the milk of other animals as an adult, when most people only drink milk, you know, when they're little babies and then they graduate to food, um, this may cause natural selection on the humans who do that and cause a genetic evolution such that they will be able to tolerate lactose later in their life than their ancestors did. And an example of the reverse sort of gene cultural evolution is if you have um, a genetic difference, say, some people have dark skin, some people have light skin, and they're living in the same environment. And the people who have light skin adopt the cultural habit of putting on a hat or holding up a parasol or putting some cream on their face to protect them from dangerous UV rays, whereas those cultural features are not as important for people who have a genetic predisposition to have dark skin that's the other sort of gene culture coevolution. So it can go in either way. It's fascinating, and we know very little about how it works, or um, you know, in the, all the richness that might come out of that. Mm -hmm. But in gene culture coevolution, we are talking about, I guess, two distinct entities: genetic evolution and cultural evolution and how genes interact with culture and vice versa. Uh, but is it easy to separate one from the other? Because I would imagine that for a given species to have culture, they had to have evolved certain kinds of psychological traits or mechanisms uh, that give a basis to culture. But then we also have culture, at least to some extent, driving genetic evolution. So, I mean, is it rigorous to really separate them? Right. That is very perceptive. And like I just told to 
um, some of my students uh, yesterday in my introductory evolution class, sometimes I lie to them. Um, well, they, they, they got lied to in their introductory evolution, uh, introductory biology course as freshmen. And then I rectify some of those lies in my introductory evolution class at the 200th level. Um, by, by, by lie, I mean that someone told them something that was mostly true, but had some very important caveats or exceptions. And, um, but even at the 200s level, I have to tell them some things that are simplifications and it won't be until much later in their career, if ever, that they realize the exceptions to those rules. And what you just pointed out in terms of genes and culture not being uh, able to be separated. So it's not just three terms, genes, culture, and their interaction. Uh, for a number of reasons, that is a false way to represent things. It's false, but it's helpful in an introductory level. And that's why I don't apologize for doing that just 10 minutes ago. But still, I uh, recognize the fact that there are many other ingredients, for one thing, and there are many levels of interaction between genes and culture. Um, and genes themselves uh, are influenced at many levels from their, the, very, the very lowest level of their expression, they're influenced by the environment, but it's not cultural necessarily. So for instance, there are microRNAs and there, there are other epigenetic effects that influence the expression of the genes. And some of those are cultural. Some of them are not, but some of them are. And so the interaction is really a fluid thing. And we, there's no substitute for understanding everything that goes into this complex uh, trait that we would call morality or language or anything else. I'll just give one example. And that is environmental influences that are not cultural. So the environment, I just used the example of um, uh, skin color. Now, uh, tanning when you go outside is not a cultural trait, although going outside more or less is a cultural trait. And so right there, culture is having an effect on skin color. Also, sun shining on light colored skin calls, causes it to darken temporarily. And this is not because it's being burned. It's because the skin is reacting plastically to it. So the same organism with the same genotype is producing a new trait because it's being exposed to the sun. So that's neither cultural nor, nor well, it is genetic. I mean, everything is genetic at some point. But it's not cultural, and yet it's an environmental influence. And so you can see just from that one example how complex the answer to the question would be as to why somebody's skin color is the way it is. Is it genes or is it, you know, culture? You know? Mm -hmm. And I think, as you mentioned, we also have to take into account the third element that is the environment. And in disciplines like, for example, behavioral ecology, people take into account the ecological conditions, for example, some society lives in and perhaps get manifested on the level of their culture. Exactly. And I would say that is the reason why of all the behavioral tr traditions there are, ethology, uh, classic psychology, um, that, um, or sociobiology, which, you know, in some senses unified all of these into what we call now behavioral ecology, which is looking at behavior of an organism as an interplay um, I mean, that's what ecology is all about, is the interplay between all the different factors that make behavior uh, what it is. I think that is where we should look to, and that is the perspective, that is the framework. The behavioral ecological framework is, is really the most powerful framework, I'd say, to understand all behavior, including human behavior. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you think about religion? I mean, do you think that it's a sort of cultural manifestation of our evolved morality? And what is the relationship there between morality and religion? Mm. Well, that's a big question, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I would. Um, 
I would say that religion is uh, adaptive. It's in, important for humans. It's present in all known cultures. Uh, that doesn't mean that the things that religion poses to exist, if religion does that, are true or actually exist. What I'm saying is that they are useful. Whether they are true is a another question uh, entirely. There are some people who believe that if we can find a um, an evolutionary mechanism or an evolutionary theory of religion, then that undermines it and shows it to be false. But that's kind of strange because we have evolutionary mechanisms for all sorts of things about humans, and we do not conclude from that that the things that we learn by those means such as arithmetic or the distance of stars, are false. But on the same, on by the same token, it's not like um, it's it's the beliefs that we have or the commitments that we have and the social connections that manifest in religion that are beneficial, not the existence of the supernatural entities themselves. So by the same token, those people who claim that if we can find an evolutionary basis for religion, then religion is true, they are wrong too. Uh, because it's only the belief, or it's only the practices, or it's only the perspective, or the mental state that has been shown to be adaptive, not the actual existence of a supernatural being. Mm -hmm. And here, are we talking about people's beliefs, or is it more about their behavior? I mean, in terms of the kinds of interactions that they establish with one another through religion. Right. And religion is like morality. I told you, um, it, or I, was, I mentioned how morality is a conglomerate of things that we just, after the fact, you know, um, thousands of years later, we, we group a bunch of things together and we call it morality. Well, religion is a lot like that. Um, we call going to church religion or uh, going to uh, synagogue or whatever it is. Um, we call prayer or meditation religion. We call beliefs, intellectual assertions of the existence of of some entities, we call that religion. So these are enormously different kinds of things. And they all, you know, they all interact with each other, for sure. But uh, we have to recognize that they have potentially different histories, all those aspects of things. And many religious people um, will differ as to what are the most important things about a religion. Um, for example, just to use um, the distinction between, say, Confucius and, and Buddha. Uh, Con Confucius, some people call Confucianism a religion, but it's extremely practical. It's mainly about, it's like the book of Proverbs for people in the Abrahamic tradition. It's not mainly about what you're supposed to believe exists out there. It's mainly about what you're supposed to do and what kind of person you're supposed to be. And yet, um, Buddha is very different. And the Buddhist, the classic Buddhist conception of religion has to do with what perspective you take on the universe and your own situation within it. Not the ordinary things that you do day to day, which were very important to, to Confucius. Now, these are going to interact with each other. And I could make the same distinction within Christianity or Islam or uh, Judaism. But what we mean when we say religion is uh, very uh, diverse. And we would have to talk a lot longer about what we're talking about if you asked me when religion evolved, for instance. So we could talk, for instance, about the belief that ancestors are still living in some way. That is a religious conception, right? And I believe with a lot of other researchers, um, um, most of whom were historically based in um, Washington University at St. Louis, 
um, that that is universal um, as a state that people go through in uh, or people's cultures have gone through. And yet the idea that there is one all powerful, all good and loving person that has created the universe. Very different, right? From just ancestor, recognizing that ancestors are still alive. So we would have to talk about what exactly we mean by religion. Right. So just one last question. Can we talk about progress in evolution? I mean, in terms of, for example, usually, particularly lay people sometimes look at those sorts of diagrams where it seems that we are progressing towards something that is better than what came before. But uh, from a scientific and philosophical perspective, does the concept of progress uh, have any meaning in, uh, from an evolutionary perspective? Yeah, great question. And it's a complicated answer. Um, I would have to say no, yes, yes, no. So it's, there's a, a little yes, but it's surrounded by no's. <laughs> so the, the old way of asking the question, whether evolution means that we're getting better, yeah. is universally decried by evolutionary biologists. No, that is not the case. And a lot of people in, say, cultural anthropology and sociology, a lot of the social scientists and humanities people, they're not on board with evolution. And part of the reason that they're not on board with evolution is they have this old fashioned view of evolution as meaning getting together, climbing you know, or getting better, climbing up the ladder of progress, et cetera. That is not the way evolutionary biologists view things. So that's the initial no. Now, the, the yet, there's another yes that happens right after that, which is that if you start from a place of no complexity, all you can go is up, right? So, uh, yes, there is some sense in which evolution produces greater complexity because even though in some particular cases there's a decline in complexity, I mentioned those uh, scale insects on the, on the pine trees, that's a decline in complexity, right? But the... But but if you're starting from no complexity in the origin of life, obviously you're going to have an increase in complexity. You're starting from this sort of table of zero. And so that's a, a trivial yes. And then there is a, a better yes or a more important yes, which is that there are some um, uh, ways in which, for instance, increased communication. We brought up uh, morality and religion earlier. Increased communication across ethnic lines in humans have resulted in uh, morality and have resulted in um, greater ability to communicate with each other and more advanced competition than we ever would have seen. And that is a more complex thing. I think that it's a wonderful thing. And so that is a yes that in certain circumstances you will see an increase like that. But then to close it out, you have a final no which is, does that mean we're getting better as humans? And I would say, no, it does not mean we're getting better. I would say the only reason why we have a decline, as Steven Pinker says, in the amount of violence over time, or the only reason we have an increase in our um, interaction or decline in racism, for instance, or xenophobia between cultures, it's, it's less common now that we try to genocidally exterminate cultures that we beat in wars than it used to be. Um, the only reason for that is because of increased comp uh, communication. And that's not a moral thing. That's just the thing about technology, you know? So we're no better. We're just communicating with each other more. We're interacting with each other more. And then it looks like we're getting better as a species. But I would say that that's a little bit of an illusion. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay, so just before we go, where can people find your work on the internet? Oh, right. Well, luckily, since I have an uncommon last name of uh, Lati, L-A-H-T-I, if you just search for David Lati, you'll find me. DavidLati.net is where my the hub of uh, what I do is, and then my lab is at uh, LatiLab.org, so L-A-H-T-I-L-A-B.org. Okay, great. So I will leave links to that in the description box of the interview. And Dr. Letty, it was a real pleasure to talk to you. Thank you for coming on the show.
Thanks, Ricardo. Great to talk to you. Hello, everybody. Thank you for watching this interview until the end. As you might have noticed, I've started this channel back in February 2018 and have been putting out regular interviews with top academics and scholars from a variety of fields. So to keep the channel sustainable, I would like to ask you to please pay a visit to my Patreon page and to consider making a pledge there. If you prefer PayPal, I also have links to that in the description box of the video. Otherwise, and if you like what I'm doing, please leave a like, share it and hit the subscription button. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my main patrons and PayPal supporters, Karen Litzke and Blanchett Perga Larsen. Lau Guerrero, Francis Ford, Hans Frederick Sunda, Ricardo Vladimiro, Craig Healy, Adam Kessel, Olaf Alex, Jonathan Wiesel, Anian Kata, Jacob Klinkby, Matthew Whittingbird, Arno Wolf, Tim Hollacy, Henry Kalenius, John Connors, Paulina Barron, Philip Force Connolly, Jerry Mueller, Herbert Kintis, Ruth Gervoz, Bo Weingard, Rebecca Newberger Goldstein, Dan Demetrio, Robert Windegger, Rui Inácio, Arthur Coe, Zup, Marco Neves, Colin Holbrook, Susan Pinker, Thomas Trumbull, Bernardo Seixas, Pablo Santurbano, Simon Columbus, Jorge Spinha, Phil Cavana, Corey Clark, Mark Blythe, Roberto Inguanzo, Mikkel Stormir, Eric Neumann, Samuel Andreev, Tiago Nunes, Bernard Yugni, Alexander Dunbauer, Omari Hickson, Fergal Cusson, Evan Bodrenko, Hal Herzog, Nuno Machado, Don Ross, João Alves da Silva, Jonathan Leibrandt, Oslem Bullut, Nathan Nguyen, Stanton T, Samuel Correa, Eric Hines, Mark Smith, J.W., João Eira, Tom Hummel, David Sloan Wilson, Yassi Ladeza Araújo, Eden Solon, Romain Roach, Dmitry Grigoriev, Diego Londonio Correa, Tom Roth, and Yannick Punter. My producers is our web, Jim Frank, Lucas Stafiniak, Ian Gilligan, Sergio Codriano, Luis Caetano, Matthew Lavender, Tom Van Egdam, Curtis Dixon, João Linhares, Benedict Mueller, Vega Gidi, Sardis Franz, and Niruban Balachandran, and my executive producers, Michel Rujewski, Rosie, and James Pratt. Thank you for all.